All right, okay. welcome. It is March 1st, 2019. I'm Jason Ross with LaRouche Pack, and I'm very happy today to be able to interview Bill Binney, former technical director at the National Security Agency. Binney has authored in the past few years major reports challenging the central premise of Russiagate, namely that Russia, in order to throw the election to Donald Trump, hacked information from the DNC, passed it on to WikiLeaks, which then published it. And this material, which showed how undemocratic the Democratic National <coughs> Committee was, caused the resignations of several top people from that agency and basically proved that there wasn't a real fair primary election in 2016. His analysis has taken on the claim about supposed proof of this taking place and also analyzed the actual files released by WikiLeaks. This Russiagate scandal has not only paralyzed the Trump administration for two years, but is fanning the flames of conflict with Russia, the other major nuclear armed power in the world. It's not a light matter to cause conflict in this way. I wanted to introduce, to give some our viewers some idea about a little bit more about you, uh, Bill, would be to talk, if you could, a little bit about your history. I know that you'd been at the NSA since 1970, I believe, since after working yep. uh, in the Army for four years um, doing intelligence there, that one of your main focuses was intelligence on Russia, that you were, I believe, the chief um, analyst on Russia at a certain point. Correct me if I'm wrong. Well. And could, could, you, could you tell us about what was your... Um, how did you choose this career pathway or, or maybe life pathway? And, and what did you do at, at NSA while you were working there? Well, it, my basic uh, uh, educational training was in mathematics. So I had an inclination toward analysis of things, you know, to think about problems and how to solve them. Uh, and so when the army came along in Vietnam, I wanted to volunteer to get the, so I didn't have to, so I got my first choice of duty. And so I picked Europe and they sent me to Turkey. I said, you know, but I just crossed the Bosporus. Now I'm in Asia. I said, I volunteered for Europe. He <laughs> said, it's, Turkey is in the NATO uh, theater. It's, it's, it's a NATO country and it's in the European theater. Uh, that's what you're in. <laughs> so I said, okay, all right, so I'm here. So that's how I got into, uh, uh, and now it's going into the army. They said, gee, you know, you have a good analytic technique. So we're gonna put you in analysis here. So. That's what they did, and uh, and I was over there in uh, Turkey and solved a few things. And uh, people back here at NSA kind of saw that stuff and said, "Gee, that's really neat. We need that guy back here," <laughs> you know. So they pulled me back. They pulled me back from Turkey. Uh, and my next orders went to NSA. So I was there from '66 uh, from '66 to '60 through '67. I was in Turkey, and then from Tur from then on till '69, I was in uh, NSA. And again, I just kept doing some of the similar things that I like doing. It was a puzzle pot, puzzle palace. So, you know, you got a lot of puzzles to solve. So <laughs> I was doing that cryptology, you know, on codes and ciphers and uh, data, data systems, things like that. Uh, but it was like uh, looking at it from um, using also mathematical techniques and so on to try to uh, look at it in a different way than they had been at the time. So I was able to do things that they had not achieved at that point. So that just... Uh, Got me hired back in as a civilian in 1970, and from there on, I just uh, kept doing and having fun. You know, it was all it was all quite uh, quite fun uh, for me to do. So I mean, it was like you know, you, you when you're in it, when you like to solve puzzles and you're in the puzzle solving palace, it's heaven. You know, so <laughs> so that's what I did, and uh, so that ended up being um, in '97. I became the technical director of the what I like to call the world. Okay, so. <laughs> I thought it was cute, <laughs> but I did, I, I, you know, because I was the technical director of the analysis of the world, the, you know, analysis and reporting area, that was about 6,000 analysts. Um, and so uh, from that point on, I was uh, basically looking at problems, analytic problems for the world. So, and, you know, that's why I did the program Thin Thread, uh, which dealt with uh, doing um, analysis of the internet and capturing the digital environment of the world. So. And the difference is that uh, we took a targeted approach, uh, looking at the, the world, uh, pulling out, I, I liken it to pulling out only the needles and, and associated uh, uh, potential needles in the haystack and letting the entire haystack go by. So that gave privacy to everybody. And also when we took people in, we 
we uh, uh, encrypted all their attributes so you couldn't tell it. Even if you were in NSA, you couldn't tell who they were unless you could do the decrypt and we didn't give that out. So nobody could do it except us, you know, so. so uh, and in the end, we had an automated program that would go through the network log and monitor everybody coming into our network and where they, where they went, what they did, how long they stayed, you know, all of that. So we would know anybody doing anything nefarious, we would pick up almost immediately. I mean, I'm saying within seconds, you know. So uh, but those were the three things that Hayden and company didn't like. And so they got rid of them. And therefore they were able, because of our system, they were able to see everything. And therefore when they removed the filtering and the encryption and the, and the monitoring, they could take all of that data in and nobody knew what they had or could follow any of it because it was just so mass, much of it. The, you, know, you, had, you left the NSA uh, in 2001. I'm wondering, the, the attacks of 9-11, did that, and the way that the intelligence community had failed to prevent that, did that play a factor in your departure? And do you have anything to say about whether that attack could have been foiled? Oh, well, sure. I mean, uh, uh, that attack and all others, by the way, before and after 9-11 could have been stopped. I mean, there were the potential, you see, the point was they had so much data coming in be, even before we did the program Thin Thread uh, that uh, that the analysts were buried. That was what I was seeing at NSA with the 6,000 analysts I was looking at. And they were all being buried by every, every day by the, that day's take. In other words, they would get 40, 50,000 items every day, something like that, you know? And nobody could get through them. Nobody could get through them at all. Look at your Google search. How many pages of Google search do you go through to get, as you know, to, as, you know, what's your average range of pages, five, six? And yet there may be, you know, a thousand or two thousand pages. So that means you have a potential of missing something that's there that's valuable to you, and you just don't see it because there's just too much data. And that's fundamentally what what was going on even even in the uh, early '90s, because of even with the less than, you know, with the with the um, what I call a, a, a orders of magnitude less capability collecting things. Now they've got orders of magnitude more capability of collecting, and it's making the problem even worse. Even in the Snowden material internally, there are at least 10 articles that were written by analysts internally in NSA saying things like they were, they were overburdened by overload and they can't see threats coming because there's just too much data to look at. So I, I, I pretty much uh, said that this is the real problem. We need to make a, put together a program that would be able to focus in on what's important in the data, pull that out and only present that to our analysts so that now they would have a chance to succeed. And that's what, what that was what was in their database even back before 9/11. Uh, they had data already there in the database to stop it. They just didn't know it was there, and they didn't find out that it was there until they ran the thin thread program on the entire database at NSA that Tom Drake did, and I think it was February of 2002. Then they found out, oh yeah, hey, there's the date of the attack too. You know, so. The point was uh, the program we did cost from start to finish and development and having it operational for 24 hours a day for uh, almost a year at three separate sites. The whole, th the whole system cost $3.2 million. That's all. So what they wanted for the example for the Trailblazer was 3.8 billion was the first request for the first five years of developing that program. That's to develop it, not deploy it or use it or anything. So just so, to just make sure I heard that right, you said Trailblazer was three point something billion compared to your billion, thin thread yeah. program was for, in the, the millions first five years, for the first five. Okay, that's only to develop it now. Uh huh. That's not deploying, using, implementing any of that. So. Uh huh. Uh, but but see the program we put together was uh, basically a fully automated one, and I mean you know the the Inspector General Department of Defense Inspector General's report on thin thread said that we were lacking all the, all the operator uh, documentation for support. What he didn't really understand was it was a fully automated, unmanned system that was remotely controlled. You know, he, he didn't understand that. So, but that was another thing that rubbed people the wrong way. We were taking people out of that equation and making it a much more centralized, easily controllable system. Uh, they didn't want that. What would be the difference in, in goals between setting up, so you've, you've contrasted your proposed system, Thin Thread, with Trailblazer. What are the different uh, wait, types can of- I, Can I correct something here, Jason, first? Yes. Our system was running, theirs was the proposal. <laughs> okay, thank you. So what, what would be <laughs> the difference- so <laughs> What 
What's the difference in goal between, because as you describe it, it seems that your system, which is focused on you know, analytical goals and then using the, the data that's required yeah. to achieve those ends, yeah. what would be the goal behind creating a larger system that collects everything, even if it's not related to analytical ends? Why would someone put in place that larger and more expensive system? Okay, well, I saw two purposes. One, one was the, the purpose was for, for Dick Cheney to have information on everybody. I mean, he grew up with Richard Nixon, and that was Nixon wanted information on his political enemies and anybody that opposed his policies, you know, like Martin Luther King, John Lennon, and so on. You know, I don't know how many, there were a couple thousand pro people in that list. And the FBI, he put the FBI, NSA, and CIA, a very familiar set of agencies, you know, who were, wrote the ICA and, and are participating in this bulk acquisition and use of it and stuff like that. So uh, <clears throat> uh, he put that together for... Uh, for Dick Cheney because he wanted to know everything basically about everybody. So uh, that meant, uh, and they could use our program that we developed to do that by removing the filter. Uh, and so uh, when they did that, that achieved his end for, uh, for Hayden, that gave him a greater, uh, uh, greater position as a bureaucrat, if you will, with a bigger budget, a bigger agency, because it takes a lot more people and a lot more money to do the kinds of things he wanted to do for Dick Cheney. Um, and himself, uh, because it, it, it engrandized him as a as a manager in the government. And you know, so, uh, you know, it's kind of, I, I look at these as ego trips and, and um, actually uh, people who are fundamentally Dick Cheney doesn't trust anybody. So, you know, it's the standard thing, know everything about everybody, just like the Stasi. That's why I call NSA the new Stasi agency. Wow. Okay. Okay. Um Following up on that, the, you'd pointed out how this is, it's, it's collecting more than is necessary to achieve analytical ends. It seems like it's more about political control or potential for blackmail. Um, could you also say anything about the legality of these programs? Are these programs legal? Uh, no, that's the first uh, objective I, uh, objection I had was the legality of it. And I, that, when I first found out, I always said, well, this is an obvious violation of the Fourth Amendment of the Constitution. It's also when you collect the metadata alone, that's a violation of the pen register law. Uh, actually the first amendment, because you no longer have free association, it's all known by the government. Um, and, it, and eventually they started using it against people to put them in jail. Mueller did, his testimony was saying that basically. And, uh, <clears throat> and that, uh, and that uh, was a violation of the fifth amendment where you're using your statements against you. That's a violation because the, the data was not acquired with a warrant. Okay, so that's a violation of the Fifth Amendment. And then they did a parallel construction then substituted it for the for the real data they used to arrest you in a court of law. And that's a violation of the Sixth Amendment, the uh, constitutional uh, right to due process and the ability to challenge discovery of any of the data used against you in a court of law. Uh, and it also violates the Electronic Privacy Act, Electronic Security Act, all the regulations governing FCC uh, uh, every FCC regulations on, on telecommunications companies and internet uh, service providers, all of that, plus, you know, the you know, pen register law. I mean, any number of things are being violated here. And as, as a part of keep it going, they're all, I mean, one of the, uh, when, when the parallel construction idea was uh, exposed by Reuters in an article in August of uh, 2013, I believe it was, they said, uh, they interviewed one of the federal agents involved in a program, and he said, this is such a great program, uh, I just hope we can keep it secret. <laughs> you know, the laws are not supposed to be secret. You know, people are supposed to know about them. You know, what, what, how our government proceeds and the legality of the courts are supposed to know, they're not told either. The judges don't have any idea what's going on here. They're just, they're just, they're just being led around like on a string, like they don't, you know, they're, they're just more idiots that they're, they're corralling in the corner in the corral, you know, get over there and do what you're told, you know, it's just, it's just a destruction of the entire, uh, our entire uh, Republic and, and our basic foundations of our, of our country. Well, what, one more question on this before we get to the uh, your, your analysis yeah. on the Russiagate things in particular. I know that you, when you raised some of these objections, you got um, kind of wondering what kind of response you got. I believe that you in particular got a certain amount of attention from the FBI. Um, could you tell us about that? Uh, yeah, this gets back to the, you know, uh, under the regulations uh, uh, for employment with the U.S. government, you are required <laughs> to... Uh, 
report fraud, waste, abuse, and corruption and illegality. Uh, and you're supposed to do that to the inspector generals of the Department of Defense, you know, your local agency or whatever. And so, um, and, and if you have any complaints about the processes you're supposed to go through, and you, when you're in the intelligence community, you're supposed to go to the members of the intelligence committees in Congress, the House and Senate House Intelligence Committee, the Senate Intelligence Committee, and, and the inspector generals, of course. So these were the channels that we were using. We also tried to go to the uh, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. So, I mean, we wanted to get in to see him, to explain to him, you know, since he is really one of the ultimate ones who is responsible for maintaining the integrity of our constitution. Um, and so we wanted to get into him to tell him what, the, what was really happening here because he was never told, right? In fact, he's never been told to my knowledge. Uh, uh, and so uh, the only people who do know is the secret court and the FISA, the FISA court, which is uh, basically, it's not an Article Three court, it's an Article Two court. It belongs to the government. It's, uh, you know, they, they have the, it's, it's a held, I think, on the sixth floor of the Department of Justice building. And uh, it's in a uh, skiff area, an encased uh, uh, room. And they go up there and, and the only thing the judge hears at that point is the uh, testimony of the government. And from that, he makes decisions, yes, you can have the warrant or no, you know. So they never hears any any separate uh, arguments or anything. Uh, so, I mean, he, they don't even know that the, all of this data being used with parallel construction and all that's a violation. I mean, it's perjury. It's all kinds of criminal activity by our own government doing this. Even us whistleblowers from NSA who stayed in the proper channels, by the way, as Feinstein was saying, he should have stayed there. Edward Snowden, he was, she was referring to. Well, we did, and they tried to put us away 35 years for doing it, you know? And they did it by, by manufacturing evidence against us. I mean, they, they were manufacturing conspiracy charges and all kinds of things. They tried three separate times to indict us. And each time I, I you know, I found, found exculpatory evidence to, to disprove what they were saying. The third time, I threatened them with malicious prosecution because they were manufacturing evidence against us and using that to get an indictment in the first place. And then also in lying in the indictment. Uh, we found out, by the way, that they did lie in the indictment because uh, somebody felt really bad at the Department of Justice as to what they were doing to us. So they sent us a copy, a draft of their draft indictment. <laughs> so we now had m more evidence about how they were manufacturing charges against us. And uh, since we uh, threatened them with that, they went away and we haven't heard from them since. Wow. I mean, not they to... belong in jail. You know, even in a... I don't call it the Department of Justice. I call it the Department of Just Us, and we're not included. <laughs> you know, I think even even people who are jaded about you know assuming that the government is always corrupt, I think it's it's just it's just astonishing what you've just what you've just stated, what you've just gone through. Well, they're criminals. I mean, we're talking about criminals here. Yeah. Well, let's let, let, let's come to the let's come to the present day. Okay. Some of your, your recent analysis, uh, the central claim of Russia Gate, which had come up in the uh, the ICA, the Intelligence yes. Community Assessment, published in January 2017. Uh, I'm just going to read two quotes from it and, and ask you about it. That intelligence community assessment said, "We assess with high confidence that Russian military intelligence, General Staff, Main Intelligence Directorate, or GRU." Use the Guccifer 2.0 persona and DC leaks to release U.S. victim data obtained in cyber operations publicly and in exclusives to media outlets and relayed material to WikiLeaks. They wrote, we assess with high confidence that the GRU relayed material it acquired from the DNC and senior Democratic officials to WikiLeaks. They write, we also assess that Putin and the Russian government aspired to help President-elect Trump's election chances, when possible, by discrediting Secretary Clinton and publicly contrasting her unfavorably to him. All three agencies agree with this judgment. CIA and FBI have high confidence in this judgment. NSA has moderate confidence. Let me ask you, if these claims were true, if it was known that if Russia had hacked the DNC, passed on the material to WikiLeaks, what type of evidence would we expect to exist that could easily prove this to be the case? Uh, well, it's pretty straightforward. The only agency there that mattered was NSA because it was a communications issue, and that's the charter of NSA within the government. Um, and uh, also... Um, uh, the fact that they say they have moderate confidence means they don't have any evidence. Okay, I know the technology speak, and that's what that means. 
they're convinced only by innuendo or some kind of a, a general assessment by the other agencies and not by themselves. So in other words, if uh, because NSA has across the network worldwide hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of trace route programs. Trace route means that they can take any packet and trace the route that it goes through the network. Uh, if you go on the web and look at the, the trace route program, uh, just Google trace route, you can read about the capabilities of that program, how it can trace the origin uh, of, a, of a packet, the segments of the internet it goes through, the timing it takes to do that, and where it ultimately ends up. <clears throat> now, when you have that capability, you know where everything's going. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, for NSA to say that they only had moderate confidence, that means they had nothing, no data to show the transfer. Uh, which was exactly consistent with the analysis that we ended up with. Because we looked at the posted WikiLeaks data, uh, um, uh, where it is the DNC data from late May, not, not uh, Goosefer 2 data. This is, not, this is separate from Goosefer 2. Uh, and that, those files all, all showed evidence of uh, what's called a FAT format, file allocation table uh, format. In other words, when you read data to a... Uh, to a thumb drive or a CD-ROM or some storage device, um, this program um, mod modifies the time that gives the last modified time change uh, to each of the files as it does it, and it changes it to the nearest even number. So uh, since uh, file transfers and timestamping the last modified can be even or odd, ending in an even or an odd number, uh, then, then uh, it's equally likely that any one of those files will be even or odd ending time last modified timestamp. Well, and in fact, all of the, like the first 500 we looked at and all the ones that subsequent to that have all ended in even numbers. Uh, that meant that there was a program that went through doing that uh, because the random probability of it just happening is like uh, one chance in two to the 500th power or like one chance in one followed by 150 zeros which is like a trillion times a trillion times a trillion, for people to try to understand, it's a trillion times a trillion times a trillion times a trillion, about 16 or 17 times. So, so there's virtually uh, no chance at all that it wasn't run by a program. So uh, that meant uh, that the file, uh, the, that implied very simply that all that data was uh, downloaded to a physical device and then physically transported before it got to WikiLeaks so they could post it. Uh, that meant it was uh, manually downloaded to some thumb drive, and and it's consistent with, with what Ambassador Craig Murray from the UK said. He met somebody involved in a transfer of data to WikiLeaks at, at the American University. So, and also, it's to, you know it's pretty clear that uh, Julian Assange gave a put up a, a reward for the murder of uh, Seth Rich. I think uh, uh, that's the only time WikiLeaks has ever done that. So, uh, um, you know, it's all pretty consistent with the idea that somebody manually transferred the data. And in NSA um, undoubtedly should have something if they have, I mean, all they have to do is get one packet of the whole data set, you know, because uh, <clears throat> each packet, when it runs through the network, uh, is it, in the housekeeping data that goes with it, that TCP IP formatted data. If you want, you can go on the web and Google a TCP IP packet format, and it'll, it'll show you what the format is. And you can see that it's got an, an, a packet identifier number. That is the, all the packets. If your email is uh, broken down into 50 packets, each of those 50 packets starts with that number. I think it's a 16-bit or 32-bit number, one of those. And, and it's the same number at the beginning of every one of the packets that belongs to that email. That's how you can reconstruct session, what we call sessionize the, the event. Uh, and then each number, it also numbers the packets in sequence, and, and it gives the originating in IP and in, in, you know IPv4 IPv6 number and also the uh, the ending IP before uh, four or six number that tells the network where where it's coming from and where to send it to I mean otherwise it won't get there so all you need is one of those packets to tell where it went so you and they didn't have any other that's why they said they had moderate confidence so I mean they should have said if we've got these if we got this evidence they should have said these are the people who did it. This is when they did it, and this is how the packets got to them. They couldn't do that with the transfer to Russia anywhere, and they also couldn't do it to WikiLeaks. Now, WikiLeaks is watched pretty hard. You know, um, as I said, I think uh, in one of the interviews I had earlier that uh, 
if Julian Assange in that embassy even opened the window and shouted out the window, he would be monitored. You know? So everything he does is monitored. And all the people who are associated with him, they're monitored too. So any of the data going electronically to them would be captured by some of the NSA monitoring devices. And I mean, they're out there by the tens of thousands around the world. So, you know, it's absurd to think that they, if, if they said they have moderate confidence, you knew right away they were, that the whole idea was a lie. In this intelligence community assessment, they had pointed to the supposed proof that Guccifer 2.0 was the Russian hacker and gave material to WikiLeaks. You and your colleagues, some of your colleagues at the Veteran Intelligence Professionals for Sanity published a memo debunking that claim. Now, let me ask you, in July 2018, Mueller released a rather detailed indictment of 12 purported GRU agents. Before he released that indictment, which had detail about the supposed evidence of these transfers, I can only presume that he must have spoken with you and interviewed nope. Assange and asked for Craig Murray's input, right? Nope, absolutely not. No, he doesn't want to know the truth. He doesn't want to deal with inconvenient facts. You Where know? did all that material well, in that indictment come from? Uh, well, it came from, I believe, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, the service provider for the DNC. I mean, it didn't come from the FBI or it didn't come from NSA. See, because if they, if they, if it came from NSA, which people assumed that it was, that was false. Okay, because anything NSA does is classified. Now, if if anything in in from classified environment is brought into and read into an indictment, it is redacted. Meaning, uh, we won't compromise uh, classified material which anything NSA class, it collects is classified. And so therefore, if that were NSA data, Mueller is now violating crimes under the Code 18 uh, Criminal Acts, uh, you know, for uh, exposing classified material uh, to the public. And he, the only person authorized to declassify material and expose it to the public is the president. Mueller doesn't have that authority. So I know that's not from NSA. So uh, that means that it came from some other third party, the, most likely the service provider for the DNC. Because also the FBI couldn't have done it because they, they don't have possession of the, of, the, of the servers for the DNC. They never gave them that. So that meant that they didn't have any first evidence and they couldn't show control of that evidence anyway because they'd never had the DNC servers. <laughs> so that leaves it up to be modified by anybody in the, in the process of transferring to the FBI, if that's in fact what they did then uh, they, they have the chance to modify it any way they want and get, before they give it to the FBI. So it, it can't be trusted. You know, it's not admissible in a court of law, you know, all that stuff. The chain of custody is broken. There's no, no chain of custody there by the FBI. Yeah, so the, the CrowdStrike, the company brought in by the DNC <laughs> to investigate the supposed hack and all of this, that's what's being relied on for this evidence. Not the. Is it normal for the FBI not to be able to examine computers in cases like this? Is this? No, uh, take, take our case, for example. Uh, what the, they had no evidence on us. They even knew from all the stellar wind collection, the domestic collection, that we had no connection with the uh, with the uh, New York Times on the, uh, on the December uh, 2005 article they wrote about the bulk surveillance. Um, and, and of course, the uh, phone taps, wiretaps. So uh, even when they didn't have any evidence, they had contrary evidence. They knew who did that, who was talking to the uh, uh, to the New York Times. It was Thomas Tam from the Department of Justice. He was the guy who was responsible for writing up the request for warrants to the FISA court. So what he was reading and the evidence given to him by the FBI showed that they already had wiretaps on these people, and and that they were reading their their emails. And so he said, this is obviously they're doing, I mean, that's they're supposed to get the, re, the, the warrant from the court first before they get that. So they're using that to get the warrant from the court to justify and continue doing what they're already doing. So this is the process they've been doing all along. And this is why it's a it's criminal acts and violations of all kinds of regulations and so on. So, you know, that's, that's what they were, that's, that, those were the people who did that. Now, in order in order for them to, uh, the, they just trumped it up, okay? They made up the thing and they raided us and just took our computers. Now, you know, that's basically the way the FBI would operate. If they want to know something in a computer, they'll go get it and take it. So why didn't they do that with the DNC? They didn't want to know. Mm. Following up on your 
article that your your memo that you had published with some members of the Veteran Intelligence Professionals <laughs> for Sanity. I know there was a lot of there were different responses to this. There was controversy both within that group and uh, a very different response I know from the administration. You were invited to meet with Mike Pompeo to discuss your views on this matter. Can you tell us what you're able to tell us about that meeting and about any follow-up from that? So, uh, uh, first of all, I can tell you everything because I wasn't. I, I have no clearance, right? And there was no restriction stated by uh, Director Pompeo when he was there. So I said, "Okay, I'm going to tell everything because I need to. I need to confront the mainstream media for the crap they've been pushing on the public." First thing he told me was that the uh, president said, "If if." Uh, I wanted to know anything about uh, any facts about the Russia Gate that he should talk to me. Uh, well, to, when he said that, you know, I said, okay, uh, you know, I'll tell you everything I know. Uh, but I was thinking, this is a really bad sign. Now, what does that tell you about what people are telling the president and Director Pompeo? They didn't have to tell him any facts. So that, that says they're just going on hot air, you know? And so I said, well, okay, this is what we know about Guccifer II. We looked at the data and we calculated the transfer rates and we said the highest rate was 49.1 megabytes per second. And we, we attempted to show that you couldn't do that, can't, couldn't transfer at that rate across the internet to, to the, across the Atlantic to Europe. And we tested it from different countries, Albania, you know, uh, Yugoslavia or, the, or Serbia and, and uh, uh, Netherlands and the UK. And the best rate we could do was between data centers in New Jersey and, and London. and. Uh, uh, the, the fastest rate we got there was only one fourth the necessary rate to transfer at the rates of downloads that came on the on the data in the goose for two days. So, so that meant that it didn't go across the net. Uh, but the, all the date, all the transfer rates that were we calculated were compatible with a thumb drive download. So, and and then we looked at the data uh, between the two groups of data, the the uh, September uh, or the July 5 data and also the one September data that Goose for Two mistakenly, I mean, this is his big mistake. He put data out there for people to look at. <laughs> so when he did that, you know, we also discovered by looking at only minutes and seconds in those data files that those two files could merge into one, like shuffling a deck of cards, you know, so that the missing, uh, the only difference was the hour and the day in the September uh, data. So that meant that the two files were really one file and that uh, Goose for Two uh, ba basically broke that file into two parts and claimed that he had two different downloads. Uh, and he did a range change on the day and the range change on the hour for the September data. So that meant, very simply put, uh, he was playing with the data and he was playing with us and fabricating. This is all a fabrication. So um, we discredited everything on Guccifer II that he was a, they, whoever Guccifer II is, is in fact fabricating everything. So that anything Guccifer II says, you have to challenge and have to prove via different means, with different methods, and different sources. Otherwise, the guy is fabricating you and pulling you, pulling your string, leading you down a, a false path. So do you agree with the assessment from the ICA that Guccifer II is a Russian hacker who provided material to the, from the DNC to WikiLeaks? Uh, I, I believe that that has never been proven, okay? And they have no evidence to prove any of that. Um, if you look at it, you know, it's most likely somebody in the intelligence community in the U.S. or the U.K., one of those two. My probabilities are, are there more than, uh, certainly not the Russians, I mean, or a transfer anywhere into Europe, okay? But this is all manufactured. So when you have a manufactured situation, you have to say who did that, and you, we really right now have no evidence to point to anybody that would in, imply that they were doing it. And that's the problem. Okay. I mean, so if we got into the NSA files, that would be a different story. Then we could surely show who did what, when, and where, if it ever happened across the net. So it sounds like, in your view, the, the central evidence there, as relied on by that ICA about proof for a Russian hack using this Guccifer II, that's, that's no proof at all. And then- It's a fabrication, yeah. It's a all the rest of the data in there is a fabrication. Even in the ICA, if you went down to page 13, I think it is, they say, to, to understand what we mean by high confidence, that does not necessarily mean we have proof to show something to be actually a fact. That, this, that basically uh, says, hey, everything we said before is not really a fact. You know, so, you know, they even discredit their own report. Right. Then I guess that let me ask you about your most recent analysis. Uh, last month, you 
co-authored a paper with Larry Johnson about the DNC hack, and this time you went really, you looked at the data very directly at the source, analyzing the files from the DNC, the emails as published by WikiLeaks itself. What did your analysis show you? Well, it basically showed that there was a, uh, as I discussed a little earlier, it was a program run on that data to read it to a storage facility, a storage device, um, which most likely is either the, is a thumb drive or some form of CD-ROM. So uh, that meant, uh, very simply put, that there was a download to a, a, a portable storage device, and it was physically transferred somewhere before WikiLeaks had it and could post it. And that was pretty consistent. I mean, when we looked at all of the uh, later files from uh, WikiLeaks, uh, uh, Podesta emails and so on, uh, th they did not show this fat format. So just the DNC files showed this fat format, the three batches of files. And they all showed that the uh, uh, fat format, the file allocation table format, which shows up when you reach things to a uh, storage uh, device. So uh, that and that meant that uh, this was most likely certainly not introduced by WikiLeaks. Otherwise, you'd have the same fat format on all the files they were putting out there, and that, that simply wasn't the case. So, so we could show that, that basically the implication from that is that it wasn't done by WikiLeaks. And so therefore, it was done before WikiLeaks. So that's compatible with the uh, fellow that Craig Murray met on the American University where he said they physically transferred data to WikiLeaks. That's compatible with what he said. So all the evidence, the positive evidence that's available, um, shows or implies that, very simply put, that uh, nobody transferred this across the net. It was all physically transferred. And so therefore, there, the whole thing has been a lie from the beginning. The stakes, it seems like the stakes could hardly be higher. Making up a lie about Russia attacking the American electoral process, running the risk of creating conflict with Russia. This isn't a casual claim to no. make. What do you what do you see as being the stakes involved in this, in this I don't, whole Russia I don't, gate I don't, thing? I don't, I, Jason, I really don't see it as any different than what they did uh, with the Thin Thread program in 9-11. They traded the security and the, and the, uh, of the people of the United States and the free world basically for money. And that, that fundamentally is what they're trying to do here. To defer, They have several reasons to do it. One is to divert the attention of people away from, uh, away from what was contained in the emails, which showed the corruption of the DNC and, and, the, and, the, and the manipulation of the primary there, um, and, and diverting it away from that and focusing on, uh, on uh, the Russians as, a, as an external threat this is standard practice. This has been done down through history so many times. It's not funny. I mean, we don't. This should be no surprise, okay? But uh, <clears throat> uh, and so the other thing was the the other thing is it fed into the other thing they wanted to do, which was create a new Cold War. Now, if you create a new Cold War, that means they can swindle us out of billion or trillions of dollars over any number of years. So this feeds that military-industrial shadow government. Uh, you know, group that uh, President Eisenhower had warned us about in 1961 when he was leaving office. So it had it served had many purposes, and as long as they could keep that going, you know, we would all be fat, dumb, and happy, and everybody's going to be, you know, swindled. So that's been the whole that's been their process from the beginning. I mean, from the beginning, they said, for example, in the uh, collect everything environment, they said you have to give up privacy for security. That's been a lie from the beginning. We could show that you could solve problems and actually stop things by doing a targeted approach. They suppressed that and went on for the money. And, and then the, we had the cybersecurity thing, the second swindle that said, and, and you found this out by Vault 7 and some of the compromises of data that the uh, attack data that NSA had, you know, hundreds of millions of lines of source code. And uh, that means tens of thousands of attacks on service, uh, on, on firewalls, servers, you know, um, uh, switches uh, uh, and, and all kinds of networks, private and so on. All these kinds of attacks exist, and they were using them to look into what people were saying and doing or planning. And, and so, uh, and they never told anybody who invented the devices or was working with them or commercially uh, productizing them so that they could fix the problem. So that meant that everybody in the U.S., the free world, around the world, anybody using these devices was vulnerable to attacks. Of, by on the weaknesses that that NSA, CIA, all these people knew already, but didn't fix. So that meant we're all sitting here fat, dumb, and happy, and exposed. 
So now we get attacked, and what happens? The first thing they say is, well, we need more money for cybersecurity. That's a swindle. You know, why don't you fix the problems you know, then maybe we'll have some security. Then if you get it, and if we get if we get attacked after that, then sure, we should have more money. Until then, no. So that's that swindle. Now, the third one they were setting up was a Cold War. This is all being done for money. I mean, basically, three words describe the, the motivating factors for all of this uh, struggle in, in, in human civilization. That's power, control, and money. Those are the three factors that govern what people do. And that's been true for, for you know, X number of millennia, <laughs> you know. No surprises. Well, I know that you know, we've been covering here in many fields on strategic fronts and others, how the rise of China, how the emergence of Russia as an independent power coming out of the, you know, the real destruction that it went through after the fall of the Soviet Union, that, you know, that this is a threat to what would, could otherwise essentially be a unipolar uh, world and that you know, attempts to prevent that, that change from occurring lead to these, these pushes for conflict, as you've said. Yeah, but I, I had a, like when they were going in saying uh, they made the verbal agreement with Russia uh, when it uh, when it was uh, falling apart in 1990, uh, uh, that they would not move NATO further east, like into Ukraine or any of that. <clears throat> and then they made a big mistake. You know, Yats is our guy. You know, let's have regime change in, in uh, Ukraine and let's move NATO into the Ukraine. Uh, well, they made the big mistake there. I said, well, if you're going to do that with Ukraine, why don't you also invite Russia into NATO? That way you're being inclusive. They're now a part of us. You know, we're all part of it. We're all together. We're all gonna fight terrorism, things like that together. We'll coordinate our actions together and we'll be together in the world. So it's, instead of being exclusive and treating them like a threat and like an enemy, you know, we're being inclusive and bringing them into the community. That, that was the big mistake that everybody did. But that's the old thinking. That's what's going on here with Russiagate. They're trying to, they're trying to leverage that old thinking that, that existed for the Cold War for such a long time that, uh, you know, people are still have it. So let's leverage that, you know, <laughs> and that's what they're doing. Hmm. But it's to swindle us again. Well, I guess let me ask you as a as like a final wrap up type <laughs> of question would be um, this. What you've gone over, I think, is is shocking. It's, it's really astonishing. And this is something that everybody should know about. It's a message to be distributed broadly. Where do we go from here? What do we what do we do? What do you think? Uh, well, I'm, I'm, uh, I, I would say uh, sue the bastards if you can. <laughs> First of all, that's what I'm doing. I've got two lawsuits I'm supporting against the government for doing this. Um, and uh, the other thing is that you try to find people in, in Congress who are, if you can't find them and they're not there, I mean, Ron Paul is one who would support these kinds of things, but I, you know, to stop this kind of stuff. I mean, at one point, uh, Amosh and Conyers, representatives in the House, Democrat, Republican representatives, had a coalition of people they wanted to uh, pull together in the House to uh, unfund the NSA bulk activity, bulk collection activity. And they were lobbied pretty heavily by President Obama and, and then uh, the uh, head of NSA, General Alexander, to not do that because, you know, again, it get, cuts into their knowledge on everybody in the world, you know, and people in power against, but they didn't seem to understand that bulk acquisition meant they were included too. So that meant all the members of the House and Senate and the, and the judges, federal judges, all the Supreme Court, the, you know, the, the, uh, everybody in the Joint Chiefs of Staff, all of them, they're all included in this bulk acquisition. They just didn't seem to pay attention to that fact. So, so they, and, and so they had this coalition that was going to vote down uh, and then they lobbied it very heavily at one point, I think I was supposed to speak to that group, uh, you know, I don't know, four, four days before they were going to vote in early uh, August. Uh, and uh, uh, at the time, uh, General uh, President Obama, once it was posted what time and all for that meeting on the uh, on the agenda for the House and why uh, President Obama called a member uh, called a meeting of all the uh, Democratic members of the House. And that meant that uh, that meeting was canceled. And so they voted uh, uh, just a few days later. And they lost that vote by 12, 12 votes in the House. So there was some considerable support already existing that uh, they were so afraid that if I got down there to talk to them, I would tell them the truth such, to such an extent that they would really realize that they needed to do something and they would pass that and that would cut down on their funding. So that was really the, uh, that was really the, the turning point. But you need to find those people like Amosh and Conyers who are, who are interested in be, really doing things and being living up to their oath of office to be to protect and defend the Constitution. 
that's not happening now. And, and a lot of them are uh, basically being accessories without even knowing what they're doing. That's the point. And so, and that's what, uh, that's why I've been trying to get into Congress to testify simply because they could no longer at that point uh, claim plausible deniability. Uh, now they'd have to do something about it and they should have all along, but they haven't. And the attorney general is all aware of this too. So that attorney general must sign off on these programs anyway. So he knows what these programs are doing. He, his oath of office is also to protect and defend the constitution. Now the president's is to protect, defend and preserve. Those are the oaths of office that they take. We don't take an oath to a, a president, to a, to an agency or to any kind of people. We take an oath to defend that constitution. As Ben Franklin said, we live in a republic if we can keep it. That's right. And I'd like to very much thank you, Bill Binney, for being on with us today and for all the, the work that you've done. And I'd like to encourage our viewers, <laughs> spread the message as widely as possible. Spread this interview. We've republished with um, Bill Binney's consent, his article, his most recent analysis of the WikiLeaks yep. data on our website here. We ask for your assistance getting these, getting this material out there, making sure that this becomes part of the public consciousness so that we can have a government that is run by elected members of government rather than an unelected yeah. bureaucracy. Yeah. So, Amen. Thank you very much. Thank you very much again. Great to have you with Thank us, you. Bill.